بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اقرأ باسم ربك الذي خلق خلق الإنسان من علق اقرأ وربك الأكرم الذي علم بالقلم علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم صدق الله العظيم Dear respected brothers and sisters in the last few weeks we didn't have class uh, so I just want to share a brief summary of the hadith that was under discussion and the portion of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam's life that is under discussion at this present time and this present class so we were at the point of Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam's 40th year and at this stage Allah had selected him to receive divine revelation the first revelation of the Quran iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq suratul halaq and um, in this situation Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam shares his experience of what occurred with him in the cave his encounter with the angel Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam the brief exchange that they had and then his reaction to that brief exchange returning home to his wife Khadija radiallahu anha trembling shaking and then his wife comforting him consoling him and then going to Waraqa bin Nawfal and sharing this experience with Waraqa because he was a learned man learned man he was a, a, a person who knew the gospel that was revealed to Isa alayhi salatu wasalam and then Waraqa sharing with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam his thoughts and his observations his remarks that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam his experience that he has had is similar to the encounters that prophets like Musa alayhi salam had had previously and that the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam will face a time when his people will expel him from his town and they will oppose him because of his message calling people towards Allah's oneness and sh- shaking the social order that was prevalent in that society in Makkah Mukarramah so we were sharing in the previous class some of the lessons to be learned from this exchange and from this encounter and today inshallah we're going to be continuing with some of those lessons and then we'll move on to a different discussion at the end and then next week we'll start a whole new discussion so within this story Aisha radiallahu anha is the narrator and she says that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam prior to meeting and encountering Jibril alayhi salatu wasalam was spending long moments in the cave of Hira in seclusion and the word that she uses to describe that is thumma hubbiba ilayhi al-khala'u that the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam was made to love seclusion and spending time alone in solitude so the wording here is hubbiba ilayhi al-khala' she's describing this in the passive tense that the love for seclusion and staying in solitude was made dear to him which means that it was coming from somewhere else that the love for staying in seclusion and spending times alone was blessed in his heart by Allah azza wa jal rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was on a mission he was on a path and a journey to seek out allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so spending long moments and lengthy times in seclusion in solitude was made dear to him it was made appealing to him now there are many things to learn from this as well because seclusion in itself is a form of worship because a person is away from all of the distractions and when that solitude and that loneliness is spent in the dhikr of Allah and the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then it's even better and this type of solitude was the practice of previous prophets as well Musa alayhi salatu wasalam when he was called for the first revelation the Torah he also spent moments alone he went on his own first and he was also in the state of fast so spending time in solitude in seclusion which is known as i'tizal it's not a bad thing and 
We see this also in the story of the people of the cave in the Quran. Allah says, وَإِذْ اِعْتَزَلْتُ مُوهُمْ وَمَا يَعْبُدُونَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ فَأْوُوا إِلَى الْكَهْفِ When you choose to seclude yourself and isolate yourselves from the people, because if you remember the story of the people of the cave, what was it? It was a small group of people that were inclined towards Allah's oneness, monotheism, and they had opposed their society and their community. And it became untenable for them. It became very difficult to live amongst the society. So Allah said that when you choose to seclude yourself from them and from that which they worship other than Allah, then seek refuge in a cave. So this is what you can say, a sunnah and a tradition of the people of Allah Azza wa Jal, that when they wanted to spend time in worship alone, then they would go and seek out this opportunity. So this is not a bid'ah or an innovation in the deen. Rather, it is a sunnah to spend time in seclusion in that sense. So for a person who's beginning their journey with Allah, a person who's beginning to walk on this path, for them to withdraw from the people and to withdraw from society so that they can avoid distractions is a good thing. But for the person who has reached spiritual heights and who is at the peak of their faith, then they are no longer in need of spending lengthy times in seclusion because even being in public does not sway them from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And such individuals have been praised in the Quran in Surah An-Nur when Allah says, رِجَالٌ لَا تُلْهِيهِمْ تِجَارَةٌ وَلَا بَيْعٌ عَنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ those are the people of Allah that you will find in the masajid and in the mosques who are not swayed by any business or trade from the dhikr of Allah. They're not swayed from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which also brings about a question which is, is Islam encouraging solitude and seclusion or does Islam encourage to live amongst the society? Is it better for a person to live in seclusion and dedicate their life to the devotion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, say in a monastery or a jungle? Or is it better for a person to live in community and society and maintain the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The answer is the latter. That though a person may need to seek out moments, and even if they have reached spiritual heights, they should still dedicate a portion of their day where they are, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in solitude. As Allah says, فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَانْصَبْ When you free yourself from all of your obligations, then be upright in worship. وَإِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ فَرْغَبْ And turn towards your Lord in earnest. With zeal. With endeavor. So even a person who has reached spiritual heights, they should always reserve a portion of their day to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in private. And the best time for that is Qiyamul Layl, Tahajjud, Salah in the middle of the night when all the people are asleep and it's a time for you to be in seclusion with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which leads us to another point which is that in the religion of Islam, monasticism is forbidden. لا رهبانية في الإسلام for a person to completely forsake all of their natural desires and to cut off from the entire world and disconnect and to live in a monastery or a jungle or somewhere where they are dedicating their entire lives to the worship of Allah, this is not encouraged in Islam. For a person to give up or take oaths, to give up on the things that Allah has made halal, those are not things that Islam encourages. Whereas a person who lives amongst society and a person who confronts and encounters the challenges on a daily basis and the struggles of people, circumstances, pressures, and then still maintains the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is far greater and virtuous than a person who has absolutely no distractions living in a monastery somewhere. Right, so this is something that we have to also remember. These are just some lessons from the word khala' that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was made to 
like or enjoy moments of solitude. And there's some other things to learn from this incident because it mentions that when the Prophet Sallallahu used to go for long moments to the cave of Hira, he would take provisions with him. He would take arrangements. He would make arrangements for his daily needs, his food, his drink, so on and so forth. One thing we learn from that is to make preparations is not against reliance in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rather, being prepared and making preparations is from the sunnah of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there is a big misunderstanding amongst people regarding this concept of tawakkul and reliance in Allah and what does it really mean. And there's an assumption that tawakkul means to not use the means that Allah has created and to place one's trust in Allah alone. So if a person is sick, then a person should not take medication, rather they should rely on Allah alone. And that's the meaning of tawakkul. But that's not the correct understanding of the concept. The correct understanding of the concept is to utilize the means that Allah has created and then place our trust in Allah, not in the means that He has created. For the means that He has created are nothing but means. But Allah can do things without means as well. So, a person should not go to sleep at night without locking their door. A person should not go to sleep at night without locking their car door. A person should not live without food and eating and drinking. These are things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed for us to use and utilize. If we look at the story of Musa alayhi salam, when he fled from Pharaoh and he helped the daughters of Shu'aib alayhi salam fetch water from the well, what does Allah mention in that story in Surah Al-Qasas a beautiful supplication and it's a supplication that we should read daily Rabbi inni lima anzalta ilayya min khayrin faqeer reaching out to Allah and seeking Allah's assistance is not against reliance in Allah rather it is the sunnah of the prophets the prophets reached out to Allah and begged from him because to be in a needless state is only Allah's state. Only Allah is needless. We all have needs. Every human has needs. Only Allah is ghani. We are all muhtaj. Only Allah is independent. We are all needy. We all have faqr. We are all faqir and fuqara. We are all needy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only Allah is ghani, independent and rich. So Prophet Musa alayhi salam in his most desperate state is saying to Allah, O oh Allah, I am in need of the good that you have revealed and sent down. Rabbi inni lima anzalta ilayya min khayrin faqeer. And to reach out to Allah and to cry and weep and to express one's need in what Allah has sent down is from the sunnah and the tradition of the prophets as this dua teaches us. And this is tawheed. This is what monotheism means. Iyaka na'bud wa iyaka nasta'een. Only you we worship Allah and only from you we seek assistance. So reaching out to Allah and saying, Ya Allah, help me. Ya Allah, send me food. Ya Allah, send me water. Ya Allah, send me my needs. This is not against reliance in Allah. One shouldn't think that, oh, I shouldn't ask Allah for anything because that means I don't trust Allah's decree or His plan. It doesn't mean that at all. Rather, reaching out to Allah and Him alone is a sign of our Faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is a lesson also that we learn from here. Now it's also mentioned that when the Prophet sallallahu used to go out and spend time in seclusion and isolation and solitude, he wouldn't stay for months on end. Rather he would come home every now and then and he would check on his family and make sure their needs are met. Which also shows us and teaches us that a person should not be away from their family for an extended period of time for the family has needs over us and we will be questioned about their needs so this is also a very important thing for us to inshallah remember from this story of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam one should also inform inform their loved ones of their surroundings nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam's family knew where he was so if there were any issues that arose, they could approach him, they could connect with him, they could contact him. It's important for us to be in touch with our families. And in this day and age, there's no excuse for us to not be in touch with our families 
if we're overseas or if we're out of town or if we're away. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam coming back every few days, returning every few days to his family teaches us this. Now, a person might ask a question, why was Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam spending this time in seclusion? The answer is to build strength in worship and to cure one's spiritual diseases, etc. Right? Now, what else happens in this story? Jibreel, the angel, squeezes the Prophet ﷺ three times. He squeezes the Prophet ﷺ. What we learn from this is that with each squeeze, Jibreel والسلام, is transferring in Rasulullah ﷺ certain rays. Right? He's transferring in Rasulullah ﷺ divine lights from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that allows Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam's angelic state to overwhelm his humanistic his 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 human state so Allah has created every human being with two conditions and two states one is the animalistic human state and one is the angelic state and we find this in our daily uh, provocations and things that we go through as humans we're sometimes provoked to do good that's our angelic state Sometimes we're provoked to do evil, and that's our human animalistic state. So by Jibreel alayhi salam hugging the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he's transferring within him light and rays that allows his angelic state to rise above and overwhelm his animalistic or human state, which also then makes Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his heart a vessel to receive the divine light and the divine revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically preparing him with each squeeze that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam is to be an intermediary between the visible world and the unseen realm alimul ghaib wa shahada or the alam of ghaib and the alam of shahada there's two realms there's the unseen realm the realm that we haven't seen yet and there's the visible realm Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam is being privy to both by this encounter with Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam Rasulullah sallallahu is now encountering a new phase in which he is going to experience things that normal human beings do not experience and he is to be the connection between the creation and the creator so with each squeeze he's being prepared for this this is the meaning of this now this type of transferring of barakah and blessing and light has happened on more than one occasions even if we look at Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam's own story with his cousin Ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhuma we know that Ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhuma was the most knowledgeable of the Quran from all of the companions radiyallahu anhum Ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhuma was known to be the mufassir of this ummah the scholar of Quranic exegesis in this ummah Hibrul Ummah he was known as and this knowledge he was endowed with because of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam's supplication to Allah for him on his behalf and on that occasion when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam prayed for him he hugged him and squeezed him with his chest or closer to his chest and said Allahumma allimhu al-kitab oh Allah teach him the book oh Allah teach him the Quran it's as if Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam is transferring into Ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhuma knowledge by this squeeze and we also see other instances in the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam similar to this in the story of Abu Huraira radiyallahu anhu which is mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari he says that i was suffering from weak memory and i complained to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam of this Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam asked me to lay down my shawl the shawl that you wear around your, your back and to cover yourself, to keep yourself warm. And he made a gesture on the shawl. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made a gesture on the shawl. And then he said, take this shawl and keep it tight with you. Wear it. He says that after I did this, my memory became so strong that I never forgot a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Hafid ibn Hajar, Asqalani rahmatullahi alayhi, he says that, what I'm going to say now, he says, Hafid ibn Hajar, what I'm going to say 
is not written in any book. If it's a mistake, then it's from my nafs. If it's correct, it's from Allah. But it's as if when the Prophet ﷺ is moving his hand, he's taking out from the treasures of memory from the unseen realm and he's placing it on that shawl. It's as if Allah is allowing this to happen. And he says that only those who are unaware of the senses of the prophets will not believe in this. All right, so, so the prophets were blessed with different senses. And that's why they were able to receive Allah's divine revelation. All right? This is what made them different from other uh, creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why one of the scholars, Muhammad al-Ghazali, rahmatullahi alayhi, he says that the disparity that you see between humans, you don't see in other species of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you see, for example, the world of lions, the world of tigers, the world of elephants, the world of fish, so on and so forth, more or less they're the same, except some differences in size, etc. But the disparity that you see between humans is the highest level of disparity that you'll see between any of Allah Ta'ala's species in creation. That one would be blessed with prophethood and one would be down in the gutters, the lowest of the low. Like Allah says, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمٍ ثُمَّ رَدَدَنَاهُ أَسْفَلَ سَافِلِينَ Indeed, we created in humans in the best construction and then we restored them to the lowest of the low. And you see this in human beings. And he says that it's because when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala selects a certain human for divine revelation, then that distinguishes them from other create creatures. يُلْقِ الرُّوحَ مِنْ أَمْرِهِ عَلَى مَنْ يَشَاءُ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ أو يُنَزِّلُ الْمَلَائِكَةَ مِنْ رُوحِ بِالرُّوحِ مِنْ أَمْرِهِ عَلَى مَنْ يَشَاءُ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ أَنْ أَنْذِرُوا أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنَا فَاتَّقُونَ Because when the spirit of Allah's divine revelation reaches whomsoever he wishes from his servants, then this makes them a different person altogether. It distinguishes them. And that's why one of the scholars says in one of the wisdoms, why did Jibreel والسلام, appear physically in front of Rasulullah? And why did the Prophet والسلام, became, become scared? If Allah wanted, Allah could have revealed tranquility in his heart. And he would have been prepared to receive Jibreel والسلام, and he wouldn't have felt scared. But why was he this, experiencing this human emotion and reacting as a human with fear at this unusual experience? It was to separate the 40 years of his life before this experience from the next portion of his life and to show that there's a massive difference and distinction between him before as a human being and him now as a human being prophet. That as a prophet, he's a very different person. Just like the human embryo, when the ruh and the spirit is blown into it, it becomes a completely different thing. But before that it was mud and then sperm and then a clot of blood and then flesh and then the flesh was skin or, or, or clothed with skin. But then it was nothing, it was empty. But when Allah Ta'ala sends the ruh and the spirit in it, it becomes something completely different. Likewise, the Prophet, 40 years of his life as a human being, he's living normally amongst his society. But when he now receives divine revelation, He's distinguished. There's a distinction. He's a different man altogether. He's a different human being altogether. And that's why Allah is reminding him about this reality in the first revelation he's receiving at that point. What is Allah saying to him? Remember your Lord who created human being from a clot. From a clot, what did Allah make the human being? Distinguished from all other creatures. A being and an entity that is able to receive divine, uh, divine revelation, that is able to acquire knowledge, that is able to learn and grow. But it was a clot, clot of blood before, nothing. Absolutely nothing, worthless in a sense. A clot of blood. Allah is reminding Rasulullah in this first revelation that he's receiving, that the same way that a clot of blood could become this full-fledged human being, you, O Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, might have been unlettered up to this point in your life but now you are being selected for divine revelation now you are being selected for higher things now you are being selected for prophethood 
and a station that is the highest station that any human being can achieve. A position that no other, other human beings cannot achieve through their efforts. Rather, it's a divine selection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And another thing that we learn from this story, the first revelation Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa receives, read in the name of your Lord who created, created human beings from a clot of blood. Read and your Lord is honorable. He taught with the pen. He taught human beings that which they do not know. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is saying before this, I'm not a reader. I'm not a reader. I'm not a reader. Yes, you are not a reader. But read with your Lord's assistance. Your Lord will assist you. Your Lord teaches humans through two ways. Either he teaches them through the book and writing, and sometimes he teaches them through divine inspiration. Both ways of teaching are mentioned in these verses. The one who teaches with a pen. And he also teaches man what he does not know. What you can acquire through reading and writing, you can't acquire. Uh, what you can re re uh, acquire through divine revelation, you can't acquire from reading and writing. Right? Because this is divine revelation that Allah selects his servants for. Allah taught you that which you did not, did not know. Likewise, we revealed our spirit, meaning the spirit of our message to you, O Rasulullah. You didn't know before what was a book, what was faith. Rather, we made this a light via which we guide our servants. So these are some of the things that we learn from this incident that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has uh, experienced. Now another thing what we learn is Aisha, uh, Khadija radiallahu anha when Rasulullah returns to his wife and she says that you are a good man, Allah will not waste your efforts, Allah will not disgrace you because you have these good qualities such as hosting people, being a a good host, you receive guests, you join kin and family ties. We learn that these actions highlighted here are a source of protection. When a person has these qualities, Allah protects them from calamities. Another thing we learn is that when you are afflicted with any difficult calamity, we should inform our family first before others, especially if they are people of understanding and knowledge. The Prophet ﷺ is saying, will they expel me? Will I also be expelled from Mecca? Because Waraka is telling him that your people are going to expel you from the town. This teaches us that even prophets had a hard time from giving up their motherland. Even prophets had a hard time in giving up their motherland. And for many of the brothers that are sitting here, I assume that you are not born in America, but you came from a different place. And you know how difficult it is to leave your motherland, right? And I'm in the same boat as you. I also left my mother, motherland. So this is a, a, a new normal human expression. And we learn in the story that we're going to read later on, after a good few lessons, the migration story. When the Prophet is migrating from Mecca to Medina, he's stopping at the hill looking at Mecca, at the top of the hill he stops and he looks at the Kaaba, he's looking towards Mecca and he's saying, you are the most beloved of lands to me. And if it were, for not, for, if it were not for the people driving me out, I would never have left. So that was Rasulullah's real human experience and emotion. Now, after Rasulullah receives this first revelation of the Quran, and he receives the message of Allah's oneness, and he's bestowed with prophethood. What was the first obligation? This is a discussion that the ulama have. Now, according to one narration, but it's a weak narration of Aisha radiallahu anha, Abu Nu'aym has mentioned in his dalail, in this first incident encounter with Jibreel alayhi salam, Jibreel alayhi salam also hits the ground with his heel and water starts to gush forth and he makes wudu. And he also leads the Prophet Sallallahu in two rakah and two units of prayer. But this is a weak narration. But there are some other narrations that strengthen it. So what we learn is that wudu 
as an obligation was mandated in Mecca. But as a recital of the Quran, the verse of wudu was revealed in Medina. Right? So just to make that distinction clear, wudu was mandated in Mecca, but the verse about wudu was revealed in Medina, which also teaches us that Rasulullah received divine revelation from Allah, and there are two types. One is the divine revelation that becomes Quran and that is recited. And then there is divine revelation Rasulullah Sallallahu receives that does not become Quran as well. Such as Rasulullah's instruction to face Jerusalem in prayer. Right? The, the fact that Rasulullah Sallallahu used to face Jerusalem in prayer, that was not a divine instruction in the Quran, but he used to face Jerusalem in prayer when he migrated to Medina Munawwara. That was an instruction Rasulullah Sallallahu receives from other than the Quran that is recited. Because Allah says quite clearly in that verse, وَمَا جَعَلْنَا الْقِبْلَةَ الَّتِي كُنْتَ عَلَيْهَا We did not make the Qibla that you were facing. And Allah is referring to Jerusalem there. As the, the Qibla, the direction that the Prophet was facing during the earlier portion of his Medinan life. But there's no such instruction in the Quran that you should face Jerusalem in prayer. So that instruction must have been revelation other than that which is recited revelation, the Quran. Right, so Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam receiving that. Now, what we also learn is that there is also another discussion here about the salah. So, if Rasulullah, because we learn that even from earlier prophethood, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is performing salah, he's performing prayer, but which salah is he performing? So, there's a difference of opinion amongst the scholars. Some scholars are saying that he had a choice to perform whichever prayers he wanted to perform, except until. Ya ayyuhal muzzammil was revealed and then salatul layl prayer in the darkness of the night the, the latter portions of the night that was prescribed upon Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi some scholars are of the opinion that no from the very beginning two prayers were obligatory and then the five became obligatory in the night of the ascension journey mi'raj and they say this based on the few verses of the Quran one verse is in surah taha one verse is in Surah Ghafir and one verse is in Surah Hud. In those Allah says, وَسَبِّحْ بِالْعَشِيِّ وَالْإِبْكَارِ Glorify your Lord morning and evening. This glorifying means pray salah. وَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ قَبْلَ طُلُوعِ الشَّمْسِ وَقَبْلَ غُرُوبِهَا The verse in Surah Taha. And glorify your Lord by praising Him, which is a reference to salah again, before the rising of the sun, which is Fajr, and before the setting of the Sun, which is Asr, Salatul Asr, and then another one. وَأَقِمِ الصَّلَاةَ طَرَفَيِ النَّهَارِ. This is in Surah Hud. Perform Salah. Clearly here it says perform Salah in the two parts of the day. One is a reference to Fajr, and one is a reference to Salatul Asr. So some of the ulama are of the opinion, some scholars are of the opinion that earlier on two prayers were obligatory until Surah Muzammil was revealed, and then Salatul Layl. Tahajjud, Qiyamul Layl prayer, prayer in the, in the middle of the night became mandatory upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa but not for the rest of the ummah. And then of course we know in the story of Isra and Mi'raj, which is going to come inshallah soon in the stories, uh, in the Meccan life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa that story of the journey from Mecca to Jerusalem and then from Jerusalem to the heavens, that is when the five prayers became mandatory. We're going to end here, inshallah. May Allah uh, give us deeper understanding. These stories are very important because this is the basis of our faith in this story. Everything starts from here. Believing in this story is part of our iman. Revelation starts from here. Everything in Islam is built upon this story. So learning this story correctly, properly, its deeper meanings, its implications, all of that is very important as it strengthens our conviction and our faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم.